So today is Advent Sunday, which is the beginning of the season of waiting, we are often told. But I must admit that I'm, I'm never entirely convinced. Waiting for what? Christmas? Well, in practice, yes, but in theory, no. Traditionally, on this day, preachers would tell us about the four last things at Advent, death, judgment, heaven, hell. Waiting for our own personal death, then? No, I would say the clue is in the name. Advent focuses our attention on the advent of the Son of God, his second coming to earth, not our own individual departure. He comes to us, we don't go to him. And so the readings reminded us of Christ's return within the time span of this generation. Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. We don't go to him, he comes to us. But how does he come to us? This is a deep mystery. The second coming is one of the stranger Christian doctrines, especially when it's perceived in the terms we find in the New Testament with angels, clouds, trumpets, flaming swords, plagues, believers taken up into the air to join Christ, and so on. I imagine that rather few of us dwell on this story very often, even theologians. Nor do we know how to picture this scene apart from the outlandish images we've inherited. Well, those images do come from ancient Jewish apocalyptic texts like the book of Daniel, and they are code there for God's deliverance of Israel from her enemies in history. What do we do with them today then? We're not sure, except to say there's a firm expectation in the tradition that he comes to us, we don't go to him. Good. But how will we know him when he comes to us? What will he look like? What will he do? This is a deep mystery. Well, here are two attempts to re-picture the second coming without the fantastic imagery, and both address the questions, how will we know him when he comes? What will he look like? What will he do? But they both imply a further question, what should we do? The first I will mention was an ITV drama called simply The Second Coming, about an ordinary Mancunian called Steve, and he was played by Christopher Eccleston. Steve likes to do ordinary things like go down the pub with his friends, he swears, and he plays darts. But Steve becomes convinced that he's the Son of God come again. He finds that he can perform extraordinary miracles, and he has a message from God that all should turn to Steve in order that the world might be saved. Well, amazingly, millions do exactly that, thanks to the power of TV and miracles. And um, interestingly, this was made in 2003, so just before social media got going, I wonder how that story might be pitched today. Anyway, in, in 2003, it was all about the TV. Well, one of Steve's friends has a different take on Steve's mission as son of God. And she insists that the only way Steve can truly save the world is to set the world free from religion by laying down his life again, for good this time, no return back to heaven. And finally, the world will realize that it must live without God altogether. That's the logic. So if God is truly dead, not even in heaven, then we'll have no higher power to appeal to, no excuses for justifying our bad behavior and selfishness, and we'll have to exercise love and respect all the more. Well, Steve realizes after some time that this is in fact his destiny. So he willingly poisons himself at his last supper and he dies. And in the final moments of the film, we hear how, now that God is truly dead, never to return, the world is indeed saved. A lasting peace has broken out, but the world has become a grayer place, it's admitted, not necessarily any happier. 
The second retelling is Dostoevsky's The Grand Inquisitor, which appears in his novel, The Brothers Karamazov. Here, Christ comes back to earth at the time of the Spanish Inquisition. He performs miracles and people begin to realize who he is and worship him. But Christ is arrested by the Inquisition who claims he's a, an imposter and they sentence him to be burnt at the stake. Well, the night before the Christ execution, the Grand Inquisitor comes to the prison cell and makes it clear that they realize exactly who he is, but the church no longer needs him. In fact, Christ is an obstacle to the church's mission. The problem is Christ offers too much freedom which the vast majority of people just can't handle. The people prefer limited knowledge, says the Inquisitor. They prefer to have structures and controls imposed upon them that their immediate needs are met, that their bellies are full and they are absolved when they need forgiveness. Those things the church can offer, explains the Inquisitor. The church might lead the people to death and destruction ultimately, but they'll be moderately happy along the way. Well, the Christ listens to this in silence, but when the Inquisitor is finished, well, in a reversal of the first betrayal, the kiss of Judas, Christ kisses the Inquisitor. The Inquisitor then releases the Christ from prison, but tells him, never come back. So the Christ disappears into the dark alleys of the city, and we hear no more of him in this story. It's as though the Son of God has died all over again, this time for good. Well, both retellings that I've just related to you very briefly of the Second Coming are clearly attacks on corporate religion, the church, but from different angles. So the first was written by an atheist, that's Russell T. Davis, the Doctor Who author. He wanted to explore the idea of what would happen if it could be proved that God was finally dead and that the church's message of love and forgiveness could be better understood without its theological trapping, so basically a humanist agenda. The second was written by Dostoevsky, and there is some debate over how to interpret this, but of course we know he was a deeply Christian thinker who, um, one of his motives was to jolt Christians out of their ecclesiastical stupor, and so I think it's plausible to assume that at least one of the things this story is doing, the Grand Inquisitor, is about re-engaging people with the deep challenge of Christ's gospel message, the call to follow Christ without compromise in case, in case we reenact all over again what in Greek is called the scandalon of the cross, our rejection of the Son of God and his death at our hands all over again. Ironically, according to these retellings of the Second Coming, Christ does indeed die all over again, in effect. Should we then be exploring the Third Coming of Jesus, and the Fourth Coming, and so on? Well, that is probably for another university sermon, another day from a braver preacher than me, but what I do want to do, or what I want to draw from these retellings, is the point I made at the beginning, that on this day of all days, we are faced with the challenge that Christ comes to us, he is coming to us, quite apart from where each of us goes at the end of our days. He comes to us, and we are presented with the challenge of recognizing him for who he is and acting accordingly. How will we know him when he comes to us? What will he look like? What will he do? Those retellings of the Second Coming remind us that the next crucial question is, what will we do? What are we doing? For that reason, I suggest Advent is about more than waiting. It's the fresh presentation of the scandal, scandal on of the cross to us. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.